Welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Andrea and I will be your host for today's webinar. I'm glad to welcome today David and Sandro. David is a PhD student at the University of Mino with a strong background in embedded systems and systems programming, while Sandro is an associate research professor at the University of Mino. In today's presentation, uh, they will uh, present disarming trust zone with TEE privilege reduction. In this talk, they will present and discuss ReZone, a new security architecture that can effectively counter ongoing privilege escalation attacks by reducing the privileges of a potentially compromised trusted OS. Before we start, a little housekeeping. Um, the presentation will last 30 minutes, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. And if you have any questions, please share them across the chat, and we will answer them once the presentation is over. Without further ado, I would like to invite you to start your presentation. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Hardware IO team and in particular Andrea for, for the invitation. I would like also to thank the audience for, for taking the time and the interest in attending our talk. Uh, so my name is uh, Sandro Pinto uh, and with me today, uh, we have uh, David, which is currently doing his PhD under my supervision. Uh, also, uh, we, we have Jose, which is also another PhD student under my supervision as a collaborator of this work and also Professor Nuno Santos, which is co-advising uh, David with me. And uh, so what uh, I'm going to do is I will try to explain our work entitled Disarming Trust Zone with the Privilege Reduction in just three slides as a kind of trailer or preview uh, about the talk. And then we will discuss the talk into more detail. So with it taking much of your time. So ARM Trust Zone technology was introduced almost two decades ago in 2004 in uh, the ARM Cortex-A portfolio, Cortex application processes as a security oriented technology. And this technology has been leveraged to build uh, TEs or trust execution environments in billions of mobile devices worldwide in different applications ranging, for example, of biometric authentication, DRM services such as one used by Netflix, or either uh, online online banking payments. But uh, the sad reality is that over, over the years, trust on assisted TE were attacked and, and was not only one, two times, it was hundreds of times. And uh, if you want to understand a little bit more about the state of affairs of the security vulnerabilities affecting interest on TEs, you can refer to this paper that we have uh, uh, published two years ago at the uh, IEEE S&P Auckland, which is SOK, Understanding Prevalent Security Vulnerabilities Interest on Assisted TE. So uh, a particular observation resulting from this study that we have done was that the majority of the reported vulnerabilities resulted from architectural flaws, which are highly linked with this excess of trust and privilege of, of the TE. And there was a, a particular gentleman whose name may sound familiar among the security experts in the audience, that was Gal Beniamini, that uh, was in fact the worst nightmare for Qualcomm between 2015 and 2017. And he basically demonstrated that it was possible on the Qualcomm TE for a normal world application with an, without any kind of privilege to hijack, for example, a trusted application, or even worse, to hijack the, the trusted operating system. And uh, yeah, once you have full control of this trust operating system in a secure world, you can basically access and tamper with the main operating system, such as Android, or you can tamper with another trusted applications, or even worse, you can basically fully compromise the secure monitor, which is the firmware running at the highest level of privilege. And this is bad, really bad. You can basically have full control of, of the system. So uh, with our work, we, we try to basically address this problem and we try to, to fix this excess level of privilege of, of the TE in the overall trust on architect. And for that, we propose Reason, and Reason basically leveraged trust zone agnostic hardware primitives available in commercial off-the-shelf platforms to partitioning a, a monolithic trust execution environment in multiple zones. And by doing that, Rezone is able to restrict DE from accessing the normal world, uh, accessing other TEs or other zones that you may want to have on your system, and even uh, 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 restricting the access to the secure monitor. 
So I pause here for a second. At this point, you should have already like the big picture about the motivation and what we have done. And so after this slide, we are going more into detail uh, of our work. So I will spend more time in the motivation and the goals and the trend model. Then David, which in fact was the one doing the heavy lifting part of this work, will explain the design, implementation, and evaluation of the, our solution. And I will back, get back at the end of the presentation just to share some final thoughts. So I will start from the overall Trasson TE software architecture. The Trasson is centered around the concept of protection domains. You have the normal world and you have also the, the secure world. And the, the normal world, typically you run your rich execution environment or your main operating system, such as Android and your normal uh, applications. On the secure world, in fact, you run these trusted operating system that is somehow minimalistic comparing to, to the main operating system that is responsible for managing these different trusted applications. Uh, one particular feature of the trust on architecture is that the normal world is it cannot access to the secure world, but the secure world is able uh, to access to the normal world. And you have a kind of secure monitor that is responsible for managing this, this world switch. Well, from a hardware perspective, what we have here is a kind of simplified view of an architecture of a dual core system, core zero, core one, private level one cache, shared level two cache, uh, and also the, the bus interconnect that connect the different me memories and peripherals and other bus masters in the systems. And the, the trust zone technology is not only uh, available on the core itself, but in fact, it propagates uh, through the system, through the bus, uh, with this non-secure bit that flows from the core to the bus. And in, in this system or in this interconnector bus, there are additional controls or additional trust zone controllers uh, that you can leverage to basically configure memory and peripherals as secure and non-secure. In particular, you have the trust zone address space controller, the task that you can use to partitioning external uh, external memory. But in the same at the same time, you can also use the trust zone protection controller that you can also use to configure peripheral as secure or non-secure. Well, uh, the, the key motivation for, for, for our work, as I as explained before, is this excess of privilege of, of the TE. And in fact, uh, if we, we look at this orthogonal view of the trust zone architecture, we can conclude, as it was demonstrated before, that the trusted OS can, for example, access uh, the normal world and other components in the system. So the best way to represent the architecture, that in my opinion is somehow misleading, uh, from an orthogonal to a vertical approach is something like this, okay? So in, in this architecture, I think it's more intuitive that the secure world is more privileged than the normal world. So all these components, uh, trusted OS and secure mom can access the, the layers that sit at top. And uh, since there are no real isolation between the EL3 and the secure EL1, what we can have in fact is something like this. So in practice, what we have uh, as the TCB of our system is not only the secure monitor, but also this trust operating system. And in our study, what we conclude was that this TCB uh, is very large because the trusted OS in practice has, uh, has a considerable size. So, what we tried to come with was one well, with a novel solution to, to fix the, this problem, but it was not really really straightforward. There were some attempts on the on the literature in the state of the art to try to address this problem, uh, mainly by moving the trusted application from the secure world to the normal world uh, and leveraging some capabilities of the trust on address space controller. I'm referring in particular to Sanctuary that was published at the NDSS conference. And it parts from the observation that the, the trust on address uh, space controller 400 implements one feature that is the identity-based filtering uh, which is able to, to, to assign memory regions to specific bus masters for non-secure access. But the problem with this solution that was demonstrated all in, in emulators, not in real hardware platforms, is that this assumption that the core ID in a cluster, typically you have like quad core, dual core, uh, 
the core ID is different for each core, but in practice, in real platforms, this doesn't, this doesn't happen. So what we conclude was that uh, in real systems, reducing the privilege of the secure UL1 was not possible only with standard trust on mechanism. Uh, because the CPUs from a cluster uh, has the same master ID, the trusted OS in practice can always uh, tamper with the trust on address space controller and change the configuration. And uh, the secure L1 and the L3 in practice has the same privilege. So we came with an hypothesis and the hypothesis was in fact that uh, we try to restrict the T privilege, uh, not by leveraging the trust zone uh, controllers, but by using additional system level hardware controllers available in commercial off the shelf platforms. So parting from this hypothesis uh, and part, uh, parting from this standard trust zone hardware architecture, we try to draft what we believed would be an ideal platform model to restricting the, the trust otherwise. And the first thing that we thought was instead of relying in this NESP, what if we had a second layer of firewalling that uh, we call the platform partition controller or PPC that uh, implies some policies that uh, are not based on the status of the NESP, but based on this uh, ID of the different masters that we call MID. And well, this is a start, but what we can conclude is that in this cluster of different cores, the cores has the same ID, so we cannot use uh, these main cores of, of the system to, to reconfigure uh, this PPC because they share the same uh, MID. So in fact, what we need is an uh, what we call ACU or auxiliary control unit that can be a simple microcontroller available in these in these modern platforms that can take the role of uh, of coordinating the configuration uh, of the access permissions of this PPC and guaranteeing uh, that these main processors cannot change at runtime the the policies that we uh, apply. So another block that is needed but is not depicted in this picture in particular because it's widespread available in the platforms is the secure boot and the secure boot basically validates the integrity and the authenticity of the firmware basically to ensure that the acu has been securely bootstrapped and is the owner of this ppc that is the most important component to enforce the policy so then we try to understand the availability of these, of these hardware primitives in, in different SOCs and from different vendors. And we surveyed 19 or 17 popular SOCs from nine different vendors. And uh, what we did, we tried to study public available reference manuals. We inspected the Linux kernel. We, we tried to find on bootloaders and we inspect also the, the security monitor, the trusted firmware. And in some cases, we also looked in existing available CVEs to try to identify specific components. And uh, these, the, the information of these studies reflected in this table. And what we can see is that uh, for the PPC, we saw that modern SOCs have, uh, have this component e either as a custom uh, or proprietary system level controller such as NXP or Xilinx. NXP has this RDC or resource domain controller. I think I can use this uh, point. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also another some widespread component that can be used as a PPC is this system memory management unit that is quite available due to the widespread use of virtualization on modern platforms. For the ACU, this is a trend acknowledged by ARM that they are integrating uh, even more and more small microcontrollers on, on these big SOCs, uh, either for platform management uh, reasons or either for security reasons. So in fact, what we conclude was that uh, from the 17 uh, SOCs that we served, 13 are able to, to, to implement uh, Rezone. And uh, in fact, for the Samsung uh, SOCs, uh, because the public available information uh, regarding the peripheral MMUs were not able to conclude if the features are enough or not. So we, we, we classified as not available. 
So, uh, with regard to the design goals, we try to come up with a novel security architecture that leverages these uh, hardware, novel hardware primitives to create the, the secure world sandbox. And we try to establish first the security properties. Uh, we need to reduce the privilege of the trusted OS. So what we want to do, if we take this vertical image as an example, we try to come up again for the orthogonal view, but then imply policies that restrict, in fact, uh, the the all the different components access to each other. So we try to uh, to reduce uh, the privilege of the trusted OS to not be able to access the normal world, the secure monitor, and the other TVs. Also, we try to establish as design goals to depend on a small TCB. In fact, relying just on the firmware running at the highest level of privilege, NEL3, and to maintain the software portability and compatibility with legacy systems because it's really important as well. And most importantly, we try to offer a good trade-off between security and performance. We know that at some point, sometimes security it comes at the cost of the trade-off. So we want to have the best of, of both worlds. So for the trade model, uh, an attacker may want to subvert the security properties that uh, we have as, as design goals. Uh, so the rich OS, as we know, is too large to be trust, but also the trusted OS, it's our intention to reduce the privilege. And so we, we take it as grant that can be compromised. Uh, so a compromised trusted OS can try to access, for example, the ACU to subvert the ACU and try to change the, the configuration of the permissions of the PPC that basically is responsible for enforcing these, these policies. We trust uh, the secure monitor and the code running on the ACU, and we consider out of scope like physical, physical attacks such as fault injection, uh, microarchitectural side channels, uh, and also denial of service attacks such as, for example, one malicious trusted OS do not release the control of the CPU to the normal world. So I pause here for a, sec a second, and now I hand it over to, to David that will explain the design, the implementation, and the evaluation. And I will get back at the end of the presentation. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David, and I'll be uh, taking the presentation from here. So let's start by looking at the design. Horizon design. This is uh, this picture. It's uh, over, uh, the results design. So the first thing, uh, the first things that we must uh, Take into consideration is that Rezon requires the, uh, the possibility to establish at least two security domains. So one for the uh, ACU and one for the processor core. And this allows us to establish the different access control uh, properties uh, depending uh, for the processor core and the ACU. Okay. Uh, so uh, then we must include custom functionality into the secure monitor. Uh, we call this extra fun functionality the Rezone trampoline. And the main, uh, uh, the main responsibility is to securely uh, exit uh, the, the control to the zone, to the TE. Then we have the gatekeeper that runs on the ACU. And trampoline and gatekeeper actually coordinate in order to securely configure the PPC. Lastly, we have the PPC. Uh, we already mentioned, and it stands between the core and the memory, and it enforces the uh, actual access control policy. Okay. The next picture uh, uh, depicts how Reason works uh, from an high level view. On the left, we have uh, execution flow of a call from the normal world to a zone, to a TE. On the middle, we have the access control policy that is established. Uh, established and on the right we have the memory layout of the system so let's actually start on the right by looking at the memory layout and looking at the memory regions we must take into consideration first memory region is the memory region of the normal world uh, which hosts the rich environment os for example android and also on the normal world uh, we have the shared memory so this uh, shared memory is used to communicate with the zone with the te on the secure world, then we have the monitor, which is the same as the typical uh, trust zone deployment. But now we also need a special zone with, for the trampoline. And again, the trampoline the main function is to safely perform entries and exits to and from a zone. And lastly, we need a memory region to host a zone, which will host a trusted OS and 
its trusted applications. Okay. Uh, now let's look at um, the memory access control policy. Uh, so the control policy is established depending on the privilege level that is executing. Uh, so starting by the, the REs or, or the normal world EL0 and EL1, uh, the RE can access its memory while it's, it's executing. So this is similar to, or it's exactly the same as trust zone, typical trust zone uh, software. It can access its memory and the shared memory. Then at uh, EL3, we have the monitor and it can access uh, all the memory it needs. It's the, since it's the most uh, trusted component of the system. And we have for the secure EL0 and EL1, we have the permissions that it can only access its uh, memory, uh, its own memory, and the shared memory. However, note that the trampoline is actually marked as read only, and this is important as um, doing so allows performing actually policy reconfiguration and also. So, okay, let's look at how we actually do the memory partitioning securely. So, the first thing. Uh, the thing that's key here is that the gatekeeper, so the code running on the ACU, authenticates the trampoline by using a secret token. This token is uh, generated uh, randomly and is uh, generated at both time, for example, and is shared between the monitor and the gatekeeper. So only they know this token. The, in our implementation, we use a 64 bit wide token. It could be larger, but uh, we find this uh, to be sufficient. And one of the most important aspects here is that while a zone is executing, the token is stored on registers that are only accessible to EL3. And what this allows is for the, the to guarantee that the secure EL1 cannot modify the X control policy. And it cannot do so because it doesn't know the secret. It's not stored in memory, so it cannot access it. So even from a design point of view, using uh, PPC-like mechanisms, which only works at the system bus level, um, some uh, uh, issues uh, are highlighted. So uh, the first thing is that the PPC only acts on the bus level, right? So this means that accesses are not um, uh, possible to control accesses to the cache, okay? So let's see an illustration here to better understand the problem. So this is what we would, we would expect. So we're running trampoline in core, core one. We do some uh, configuration, and we want to mark this memory as not accessible. Okay. So right uh, now we have the core one executing, and it tries to access the memory region, the memory region that we don't want the core to access, and the PPC blocks it. However, this is not how things work, because the data uh, regarding that memory region can actually be in cache, and if it's in cache, when the core tries to access it. It will do a cache hit, and it will freely uh, be, free, be free to access it as uh, at will. So, what can we solve this problem? Well, what we do is uh, flush the caches to memory, and this will result in the data in the cache being written to memory, and the it, the data uh, the cache contents being erased. And now, when a core tries to access tries to access memory that is marked as non-accessible, the PPC will actually trigger and block the access. So this is one of the first issue. The second issue um, will actually uh, force us to hold cores on the same cluster. And this is because we can differentiate between bus accesses of co-located cluster cores. And this means that the access control policy applies to all cores the same. So let's look at an illustration here again. So we are uh, now we have two cores, one running the rich environment, and one executing the trampoline, and the trampoline will actually, will actually enter a zone. So we configure the TPC, and because we are entering a zone, uh, we want the normal world memory to not be accessible. The the, and the TE starts executing, so it's a zone. However, we are still ex executing code in the core zero regarding the normal world. And when we the core zero tries to access its memory, it will not be able to do so. Okay, so this is the problem. So what we must do is actually the trampoline must actually suspend all other cores in the cluster. And only after the cores are suspended can we safely reconfigure the PPC and then proceed the execution. Okay, so finally, let's look at the execution flow of a call to the to a zone. So the flow starts on the normal normal world, 
a normal world will issue a secure monitor call. Uh, it will uh, uh, be handled eventually by the trampoline, and trampoline and gatekeeper will coordinate uh, to lock uh, to unlock the TPC, reconfigure it, and lock it again. And then the, the execution control will be handed over to the zone. After the zone does what it's supposed to, the zone will return to the secure monitor. The trampoline and the gatekeeper will coordinate again in order to unlock the PPC, reconfigure it, and lock it again, and then re uh, resume the execution on the normal world. Okay, so these were the main design, uh, the main design aspects. Let's look now at some implementation implementation aspects. So our testbed is the NXP's IMX 8MQ. Uh, we use its RDC as uh, PPC, is the resource domain controller. And we use its Cortex M4 built into the ASUC as an ACU. For software, we leverage Trusted Firmware A as monitor, and we use OptE as a TE. And for normal world, we use a mixture of embedded Linux and Android uh, to perform our tests. Okay. There are uh, uh, a few implementation challenges that we had to overcome. I'm not going to go over in detail, but let's overview them. So the first one is cross core. Synchronization, as you might have uh, guessed from uh, one of the previous examples. So we must synch use synchronization primitives and then interrupt to make sure that all cores are halted before uh, running a zone. And the second challenge is microarchitectural micro -architectural maintenance, where we do uh, co cache maintenance and TLB maintenance. And we uh, have evaluated this issue uh, deeply and we make sure that we have as little impact as possible face, facing our limitations then we use um, uh, the way we implement the dynamic PC reconfiguration um, is actually optimized in order to to diminish the time spent in reconfiguration and the last issue which is the most interesting one is how we handle exceptions at security l1 exits most of the other three uh, challenges have been somewhat uh, handled or addressed by similar studies, but the way we handle exception to security L1 is quite unique, and we think you will uh, enjoy knowing these details. So we have two issues. We must prevent crashes, so let's start by looking at that. So the first issue is that the TLB, so the translation with a size buffer, which contains uh, how uh, memory, virtual memory translates to physical memory, may not have the required EL3 TLB entries. And so when the zone exits, the TLB will try to execute trampoline, it will not be able to map memory, and will try to fetch page tables. However, remember that we marked the monitor memory, which holds the page tables, as not accessible. And this will result in a crash, and the program will simply not be, will not continue, since it can't translate uh, the memory to run the code. So this is the first issue. The second issue is that uh, we must uh, keep some things in mind. The trampoline is read-only, right? And the PPC doesn't control cache accesses. And so what this allows um, a malicious trusted OS to do is actually is to make a read access, which will fetch the memory to the cache, and once in the cache, a malicious OS can modify it uh, maliciously. And he, uh, in this case, he can modify the code, the L3 code, that will handle the exit. And this will give him, an att the attacker, execution privileges at the L3, and which will allow, them, allow him to undo the access control policy. Okay, so we have two issues, a, a crash because of TLB and uh, uh, a code injection on the cache. The way we solve them, is by disabling the EL3 MMU. So this solves the TLB uh, misses because now we don't have translation um, uh, enabled while we are executing a zone. So there's no crash. And on ARM, once, once you disable the MMU, the cache is bypassed. So we're no longer no longer at risk of having of running injected code. However, we must do an additional step with this. We must invalidate the cache, thus removing the malicious, the potentially malicious code on the cache before enabling the MMU. OK, so these were implementation um, uh, aspects. I hope you find them uh, interesting. Now let's look at some evaluation. 
uh, starting by the performance, we do some micro benchmarks and we leverage up the X test test suite. This suite provides uh, some benchmark tests, such as storage, SHA, and AES algorithms. And it also, although it's not meant to be used as a benchmark, the test suite actually exercises uh, varying uh, workloads, workload types on the CTR world, and we find them. We found them quite uh, useful to understand how Rezone is impacts uh, the CTR world workloads. And one of the most interesting things, for example, if you look at the internal API to global uh, group of tests, we see that's one of the most impacted. So uh, four times slower execution times. And but if if we look at the embed TLS tests, we see that they are not affected as much. But what you can conclude, what we conclude from from this test is that shorter execution times translate into higher overheads. And to uh, make sure that this was the case, we actually uh, delve deeper into this and we modified some tests. And we arrived at the conclusion that uh, for workloads having many small calls uh, would uh, exhibit much higher overheads than workloads which have fewer but larger calls. So this is one of the main interesting things we found. We also wanted to look at real, real world applications. And we have here a Bitcoin wallet. And this uh, helps us evaluate non-high high frequency workloads. Uh, this TA is actually quite realistic because it uses various T APIs. The way this has to set up, we measure the program execution um, for each operation. The main finding here, uh, the main interesting finding here is the corroboration of what we observed previously, in that shorter uh, operations uh, will result in higher overheads. For example, if you look at the check if master key exists operation, we see that overhead is close to, to uh, over uh, two times slowdown. But if you look at the signed transaction, it's actually much smaller than that. The second application is the RM, and this helps us evaluate the impact on uh, high frequency workloads. The DRM application uh, decrypts the video content on the TE and then uh, the and that is then uh, made available to the normal world to present it to the user. And we have measures uh, for this uh, both of these operations. So we measured the TE data decryption times which is on the left here and we observed uh, uh, one and a half times slowdown. And we also measure uh, how the application is impacted by Rezone by measuring the interval between data processing events. Because the data processing events, uh, the interval is much larger than the time it takes to decrypt the data, we find that the user experience on the RM, on the RM workloads is not significantly affected. Finally, uh, we also wanted to evaluate things security-wise. And what we did, uh, was first start by assuming that we have multiple zones with one trusted application per zone. And we then look at CVEs uh, that are rated critical regarding to TEs. And these CVEs we got them from our previous work. We found that Rezone mitigates against the most trusted OS and trusted application vulnerabilities. And this is because it prevents attackers from gaining, uh, from escalating privileges and from, from compromising other parts of the system. However, Rezone doesn't mitigate against poorly implemented TAs that, for example, uh, disclose secrets, hardware attacks, cryptographic flaws, or bootloader flaws. Uh, 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 sorry, just to, just wanted to, to say something before. Um, and overall, uh, Rezone uh, mitigates 87% of the critical vulnerabilities, a quite significant number. So now I want to, to give words to Professor Pinto in order to conclude with some final thoughts. Thank you, thank you, David. So just sharing some final thoughts to wrap up this presentation. Uh, so in the paper, uh, well, the, the presentation and the focus of the paper is for platforms prior to ARMv8.4. Uh, and uh, ARMv8.4 basically introduced this secure hypervisor mode. And you may argue basically that this uh, new hypervisor mode on the secure world can basically create isolation between the trust, uh, the different trust of the OS. And this is true, but th the fact that is not true is that this fundamental problem that we are fixing here is still here because the, hyper the secure hypervisor 
can also access the secure monitor and, and vice versa, and the secure world components can still access the normal world. So uh, we believe, and in the paper we discuss, our zone can still be uh, used in these platforms. Uh, from a different perspective in the ARM v9 architecture that was introduced a few months ago, uh, ARM already recognized these architectural flaws of existing in the previous architectures. And in this new architecture, this EL3 uh, is now a root world and is completely isolated from the other from the other worlds, from the secure world and this new realm world. But uh, still in this architecture, realm world and secure world can access the normal world. So in the paper, we discuss how we envision Rezone helping uh, in this uh, new, uh, new architecture. And still because the ARMv9 platforms uh, are not available in particular because this specific architecture will be just available in ARMv9.2. So in summary, uh, we have explained why Trazon TEs have architectural flaws. We have proposed Rezone as a novel security architecture that address and fix and reduce the privilege of a TE. Uh, how we do that by leveraging trust on agnostic hardware primitives that we show that are widespread available in, in commercial off-the-shelf platforms. Uh, in fact, we implement and evaluate Rezone in a real-world platform, not only on emulators and in, on the paper, such as former work. And uh, we, we, we conduct an extensive evaluation that, uh, that basically concludes that uh, despite these gains in terms of security, the performance of real world applications uh, is not significantly affected. And we explained how Reason could help mitigate these high severity vulnerabilities. So I finish here the presentation and uh, now David and I will be happy to address all, all your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we already have a question in the chat, bo uh, in the chat box. Uh, how does your approach compare to Multizone and C5's World Guard approaches for Risk V? Uh, David, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? Uh, I think you, you're more qualified to answer that. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, uh, the, the solutions that uh, they, they are trying to, to compare is, is not on R, is on RISC V. In particular, I'm quite familiar with multi-zone. And, uh, and basically, the, the, what we tried here was to, to grab some ideas from the RISC V world, because in the RISC V world, in fact, the IGRS privilege mode is completely isolated uh, from, um, from, from the, the, the privilege levels that sit at top. And in fact, in RISC V, what we you have is a, a kind of component uh, that is the PMP that uh, we try to basically uh, emulate with this trust zone agnostic platform. So to go to the point of your question, so we were inspired with the, with the work that we did on Risk Five, and we came with these ideas and we part from this observation of the existence of these system level hardware controllers in ARM platforms. And uh, yeah, we bring this solution. So the comparison is they try to address the, the same problem and uh, at the end of the day, they don't suffer from those problems. Um, I would like to thank you again for uh, coming and uh, for doing this great presentation. I think people really liked it and I see that uh, they are also thanking you. Um, it would be nice if you would give a shout out uh, to David and Sandra on social media for the talk and hope to see you next week with another uh, webinar. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank, thank you again for, for the invitation and thank you all for attending our talk.